we all know that you can't pick your parents, that is, without the benefit of a time machine, and even then, you'll stumble into multiple logical fallacies. But never mind. Scientists have now added an asterisk and a footnote to that adage about parents, that you can't change them. But you may not have to play the genetic hand that they dealt you. Imagine taking out the genes for traits you don't like and adding in some for those you want. There's a single letter in the DNA alphabet that causes sickle cell disease, and we just need to change that letter back to what's found in healthy people. We're on the cusp of modifying our behavior, our looks, our health, by changing the very genes that give rise to them. Powerful new tools to manipulate our DNA will mean that inherited genes are no longer destiny. And these techniques may give new meaning to the phrase self-made man or woman. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology. And in this episode, technology that may fundamentally change your biology. It's one thing to bleach your hair. It is another to insert the gene or genes for blonde hair directly into your DNA. Also, imagine correcting congenital diseases without drugs or deleting inherited genes responsible for Alzheimer's. A powerful new tool called CRISPR is poised to let us edit genes with great precision and do so quickly. And the tinkering is not confined to big, expensive labs. Biohackers who want to make CRISPR technology democratic are using it in their own homes and selling kits on the Internet. Are you ready for the latest in the genetic revolution? It's Genie in a Bottle. First, okay, you can't choose your parents, but let's take a closer look at the genes they bequeathed you. We're not talking just about your birth parents, but your ancestors many generations back, because the genes that confer in you high metabolism, quick reflexes, and a propensity for puns have been in the human gene pool a long time, and most of them for good reason. Okay, I'm not sure about the pun gene, although I'm tempted to make a pungent comment about that. The others, well, they had survival value. Okay, I'm still wincing at that one. Take the suite of genes that allow our bodies to store fat. In fact, you can have all of mine. Back in our foraging days, hundreds of thousands of years ago, it made sense for our bodies to retain energy-rich fat because you never knew when you'd get an opportunity for more. You might need to live off that roasted shank of mammoth for, who knows, a long time before you hunted down another. But today, for many of us, our relationship to food has dramatically changed, while our genes have not. We live in a time of considerable comestible abundance, and that has consequences. I mean, put it this way. If you're never more than a few minutes from chowing down on a bacon cheeseburger or a pint of chocolate banana ice cream, you've noticed that uh, instant gratification has left its calling card on your waist or your hips or in the form of insulin resistance. Too much of a good thing is the title of Lee Goldman's book about the many modern illnesses brought about by our once beneficial ancestral genes. The cardiologist and dean of the medical school at Columbia University says this includes not just obesity, but, and perhaps surprisingly, depression. So our bodies are extraordinarily efficient at storing the fat that we like to eat whenever food is available and whenever it's plentiful. That's great for the Paleolithic era. But today it explains why 38% of Americans are frankly obese. That means they're more than 30% overweight. Another one-third are overweight. It's because we eat more than we need to, and we store it as more fat than we need. And even worse, that excess fat, that excess weight, precipitates in many of us what's called type 2 diabetes. And now close to 15% of Americans have diabetes because they weigh too much. All right, so obesity, its companion diseases like diabetes or are frankly killing us. The fact that we like cheesecake or other high-calorie, fat-laden foods, I mean, that's an inheritance, right? On the savannas, when you didn't know when you might get your next meal, stocking up on that stuff was obviously a hedge against future adversity. Today, it just makes us fat. So this is actually hardwired, this this behavior, the fact that I want that, I don't know, dish of French fries. Exactly. So our eating habits are largely hardwired. Our tongues, our taste buds uh, love sugar, salt, and the consistency of fatty foods, as well as protein. That drives most of our eating habits. The more those foods are available, especially 
in calorie-dense modern foods, the more we eat. So it sounds to me fairly obvious what's happening when we try to lose weight. It's hard to beat our DNA. There are thousands of diets, and I suspect tens of millions of dieters, and yet it seems that most people fail, and, and they're betrayed by their own genes in a sense to say, oh, lack of willpower, you don't really want to do it. All that's maybe not really what's going on. So the inability to stay on a diet and to lose weight is not usually a result of moral weakness. It's because food is available and we want it. And even worse, if you try to lose weight, you actually get hungrier and your body slows down your metabolism so you won't lose the weight. Those were great survival advantages in the Paleolithic era when food was in short supply. That helped our ancestors get through those tough times. We now have those same genes today, even though we really don't want them. <laughs> well, what about the fact that they were always on the move in the old days, too? I mean, they, they were, I don't know, moving around the savannas looking for that next meal, something that we don't really have to do now. We just plunk into our cars and drive through the drive through window. I mean... Well, well, right. Since the Industrial Revolution, the amount of exercise people perform has gradually declined. Some people have increased their leisure time physical activity, but the actual amount of activity performed in Western societies like America has declined because there's so much less in the way of occupational uh, physical activity. Not only that, people commonly overestimate how many calories they burn. You can run a treadmill for a half an hour or more and burn fewer calories than a single Starbucks muffin. <laughs> Maybe that says something about the Starbucks muffins. It but does. You also talk about the role of salt. Today we eat too much salt. We suffer from high blood pressure. I mean, obviously there might have been a time when coming across a bag of potato chips might have been a good thing. So for most of human history, salt has been more valuable than gold. And the reason is that of all the animals, our biggest advantage is that we have the best endurance. We aren't the fastest runners, but we can go the longest. A cheetah is the fastest runner, but if you put a cheetah on a treadmill, it'll run for about a mile or a mile and a half, lie down on the treadmill, and roll off because its temperature has risen to 107 degrees and it simply can't go any further. We keep our body temperatures from getting that high because we can sweat, and the evaporation of the sweat cools us off. To do that, we have to have enough salt and water so that when we sweat, we don't get severely dehydrated. That's why people always craved salt and why we had to have water readily available terrific survival advantage back in the old days, but now the excess salt that we eat explains why one-third of Americans have high blood pressure. Where would our ancestors have gotten salt, you know, back in the hunter-gatherer days? Well, they got most of their salt from eating animals. So it turns out that if you eat just animals, you'll do just fine. The point, though, is you have to eat the whole animal. Gnaw on the bones, eat the liver, eat everything. If you do that, you get everything you need. And that's how people got most of their salt. The problem with salt uh, developed as people settled down and became farmers and might not have sufficient access to milk or meat. In those cases, they needed access to salt. And that's why people figured out how to get salt from salt rocks, salt water, etc. Interestingly, the Roman soldiers were often paid in salt. In fact, the word salary is derived from the Roman word sal for salt. And what about high blood pressure? Because obviously that's related to salt. Uh, are you saying that our ancestors probably didn't have it because they didn't have very much salt? What we know is that if you look at still existing isolated hunter-gatherer tribes, their salt intakes are so low comparatively that they never develop a high blood pressure. Their salt intakes are sufficient to meet their losses through sweat and urine, but not anywhere nearly as high as what we have in the modern industrialized world. One of the most interesting chapters in your book, Lee, and maybe that's because it's not quite as intuitive as the other sorts of things like obesity and high blood pressure and so forth, is modern fears, anxieties, depression. And you begin the discussion with uh, considering murder. It turns out that our hunter-gatherer ancestors were maybe not quite so peaceful. Do the... Uh quote, peaceful savage, unquote, is, is a, a myth. Lots of data show that in the Paleolithic era, about 15% of people died from trauma. We know that by looking at their skeletons. Most commonly, a gash in the left side of the head, most likely from a right-handed adversary. Uh, when people settled down and uh, became farmers, as best we can tell, 
the violent death rate rose to 25% because there was more to fight about. We actually live in the safest time in the history of the world. Today, uh, in America, more people die from suicide than from murder and war put together. But we still have the fears of the old days. And here's a good example. We are naturally afraid of spiders and snakes. You show a little kid a spider or a snake, and they're afraid. You show them a car or a gun, they're not afraid. In modern America, kids don't die from snakes and spiders. They die from cars and guns. But those aren't hardwire fear traits. We still have the fears that were built into our genes back in the Paleolithic era. But getting back to murder for a moment, how was murder adaptive? I mean, what advantage did it give? I, I, I can imagine you could take your neighbor's mate or his food supply, but was there more to it than that? The murderers were mostly men, and they got the woman, and they got whatever other assets came along with it. In many ways, we are the descendants of people who did or certainly were willing to murder other people. We're obviously not the descendants of people who got killed because in most times, their entire families got killed as well. So we have that ability to be violent. Uh, in the modern world, that has to be suppressed because that's not socially appropriate. But, but does that mean that, you know, deep inside we're all murderers? Or maybe we all have murderous thoughts at least. Hopefully uh, none of us are going to be murderers, but clearly studies show that if faced with a sufficient threat to themselves or their families, essentially everybody is willing to kill another person in order to save themselves or their family. Okay, but that that has clear survival value. I clear mean, survival. I, yeah, but I, I could think that okay, you might have a murder gene in you somewhere. I don't know, but you know, if everybody had that, society really would fall apart if everybody's killing everybody else all the time. I mean, there's got to be some sort of equilibrium situation where not more than a few percent of the population is actually committing murders. We don't know about any murder genes. I, I would just say that we have a strong survival trait, and really there two things we commonly talk about in terms of that, fight or flight. Uh, but there's a third approach, and that's basically cower in submission and hope you don't get killed. And as best as we can tell, that trait is what now links to the modern problems with depression. You cower, you become submissive, you don't fight back, uh, you become very passive. And if you rebound to live and fight another day, that's adaptive. If you don't rebound, that's what we now call depression. But these fears of being killed, these traits to become submissive when fight or flight wouldn't work, they are, as best as we can tell, uh, the DNA that now leads to anxiety and depression, which are two of the leading causes of disability in modern America. Well, it sounds like that suggesting a, a treatment for anxiety and depression. You know, just become more aggressive. Well... Uh, <laughs> Uh, just becoming more aggressive is, is not socially appropriate. And so one of the conundrums of modern life is that you can't go too far in either direction. Well, what's very interesting about this book, Lee, is that you've pointed out that some of the things that most trouble us today are hardwired into us. So, you know, we think of uh, good genes are those that keep us slim and happy, but those aren't the ones we have. So how do we beat this? I mean, it's like we're still driving century-old cars on 21st century freeways. We're born with all this genetic baggage, but it's not so easy to get rid of it, is it? It's essentially impossible for us to evolve our genes to get out of this conundrum. We know that each of us has about 6 billion pieces of genetic information in our DNA, and we vary from our parents in about 60 of those 6 billion. Those are, in essence typographical errors. If those typographical errors are beneficial, we pass them on to our children and eventually they can spread uh, more widely through the population. But that takes time, hundreds of generations. We don't have hundreds of generations to deal with these traits that are now killing us, so natural evolution is never going to get us there. Second possibility is we all change our behaviors. We become more virtuous. Well, some of us will be successful but many won't, not because we're morally weak, probably because our genes are just stronger and make it more difficult for us to get there. And so I think behavior change is always worth trying, but we're fooling ourselves if we think that's going to be the worldwide solution. If it were, we wouldn't see so many more people becoming obese, hypertensive, anxious, and depressed. Could this happen with legislation? Some evidence that uh, legislation to reduce 
Uh, the amount of salt in food can reduce salt intake. We certainly know that legislation to limit smoking can reduce smoking and, as a result, heart attacks. But we live in the land of the free, and we tend not to be very enthusiastic about limiting personal choice. Well, what about the obvious? What about the techno fix? You know, reorganize the, our genes and so forth. Maybe the answer is designer babies that don't crave cheesecake, don't have high blood pressure, and don't get depressed. Well, I'm a big fan of modern science. I get no money from the pharmaceutical industry. But I don't think this is about designer babies or gene editing. I think this is more about identifying genes we no longer need and finding ways to blunt or neutralize their effect. A good example that I use in, in my book is the PCSK9 gene, a gene that helps us form cholesterol, LDL or bad cholesterol. Now, we need some of that just to form our cell membranes. If we had none of it at all, we couldn't be alive. And presumably, that's why all of us have many of these genes that help us make LDL, or what we now call bad cholesterol. Well, in the Dallas area, a heart study found a woman who was missing both copies, for her mother and her father, of the gene, this PCSK9 gene, that helps make cholesterol. As a result, her LDL, or bad cholesterol level, was 14. Now, most of us have LDL cholesterol levels much, much higher than that. In fact, even when we aggressively treat people who've had heart attacks, we try to get the LDL cholesterol down to below 70 or maybe down to 50, but 14 was unheard of. And by the way, she's perfectly healthy. So this is proof of principle, a gene that almost all of us have two copies of. She has neither copy of, but she's perfectly healthy. We don't need that gene anymore. Medications that can blunt or neutralize the effect of genes we don't need can really make a huge difference in terms of our future here. I think it's less about editing them out, uh, which is very cumbersome and unlikely to be feasible in every one of us, uh, but more about uh, specific interventions that can blunt those genes we no longer need. Lee Goldman, thank you so very much for being with us today. My pleasure. Lee Goldman is a cardiologist and dean of the medical school at Columbia University. His book is Too Much of a Good Thing, How Four Key Survival Traits Are Now Killing Us. Clearly, the important point here is that so many of the ills of modern life are due to ills of ancient life. We're just hardwired to do all sorts of things that turn out now not to be so good for us which were good for us back then. Yes, exactly. And, you know, in a sense, I felt some sort of satisfaction in knowing that I don't need to beat myself up too much when I can't follow my own diet because uh, I, I'm, I'm battling my genes. It's David versus Goliath, and I'm not Goliath. Well, I'm battling my genes, too. That's why I try not to eat the cheesecake so I can fit into my genes. Well... Dr. Goldman says we might use medication one day to blunt out specific genes, but he doesn't hold out hope for the feasibility of editing genes. Other researchers not only do, they're working on it. We'll meet one who is using a powerful tool to let us edit our DNA quickly and with great precision. And then later in the show, we'll meet a biohacker who is doing the same at home. When DNA is no longer destiny, how the new CRISPR technology could change everything next. It's Genie in a Bottle on Big Picture Science. It's the most used piece of furniture in your house. No, not the fridge, your mattress. Chances are you'll spend nearly 30 years stretched out on one. So why not make it the best? The Casper is an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price. It combines supportive memory foams for an impeccable sleep surface, perfect give, and just the right bounce. Hey, that's important, right? Internet reviews, and there have been more than 20,000, give Casper a rating of 4.8 stars. And guess what? It's designed, engineered, and assembled right here in the U.S. Look, you can try Casper in your own bedroom for 100 nights risk-free, don't love it? No worries. They'll pick it up and refund you everything. And as a Big Picture Science listener, you can get $50 toward a mattress purchase by visiting www.casper.com slash big picture, promo code big picture. Easy peasy. You snooze, you win. Terms and conditions apply.
We all have behaviors and traits that we're glad to have inherited from our ancestors. Uh, you may be thankful that that great-great-grandfather had a full head of hair and that his genes are keeping your noggin hirsute and warm into your seventh decade, if that's happening with you. But of course, we also inherit troublesome genes. We've heard about some of them from Lee Goldman, but there are many more. Genes for sickle cell anemia, a red blood cell disorder. Genes for Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. But what if we could just delete these unwanted genes from our DNA? The gene editing tool CRISPR may allow us to do that one day. The technology is adapted from a natural gene editing process that bacteria use to protect themselves against viral infection, a process that scientists discovered a decade ago. And bacteria have had a long time to perfect this technology. I mean, there have been hundreds of millions of years of R&D behind it, if you will. As a result, CRISPR is precise, and we're learning how to use it to swap out genes and other organisms with all the ease of cutting and pasting a Word document. Well, okay, CRISPR is a little more complicated than that, but the concept is similar. Here's a thought experiment to illustrate. Let's say we wanted to edit the following sentence. It was the best of times. It was the Worcestershire sauce of times. Now, that's very close to what we want to say, but we need to make one change. CRISPR technology allows us to make precise edits and insertions. So, for example... Worcestershire sauce becomes worst. And so we have, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Simple, right? But CRISPR has the potential to make more complicated edits. Why stop at changing one word, one gene? Let's consider this. Gary, can you help? Yeah, sure. Okay, we're going to modify this paragraph I typed up here. First, read the original out loud. Okay. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing, end them. Okay, that's pretty good. Whoever wrote that is an excellent writer, but I think we can improve on it. You ready? Yep. Okay. I'll make some changes. Here's a pen. Okay. You ever seen a pen? <laughs> a few of them, yeah. Okay. I wonder if you could do the following. Keep the first B and the second B. Okay. okay. And also the ands, but get rid of some of that other stuff. Mm -hmm. there. Okay. Um, we're going to move things around. Keep the word arrows mm -hmm. and make a copy of it and add an SP before one of them. Okay. Okay. Keep the F of fortunes and make it F for friends. All right. Okay. Add the word tender right there and uh, gentle right there. Okay, and then the phrase regarding love. Um, take out the end of arms and the world against, but leave the T. All right, got okay. it. Turn that into the word art. Okay. Okay. Swap out the phrase boy who shoots for seas of troubles. Okay. Okay, let's see what you have there. All right, I'll just make a few other changes here. This, and then we add the word heart at the end. Okay, reread what we started with. To be or not to be, that is the question, whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing, end them. And what we created with a few imaginative swaps. I'd be tender, I'd be gentle, and awful sentimental regarding love and art. I'd be friends with the sparrows and the boy who shoots the arrows, if I only had a heart. I've always loved the Wizard of Oz. Is there any limit to the number of changes that CRISPR could make to an organism's genome? We had many questions when Molly went to visit Jacob Korn, the scientific director of the Innovative Genomics Initiative at the University of California in Berkeley, whose team is using and developing CRISPR technology. Okay, I see that there are a lot of, um, well, test tubes. That's reassuring. That's familiar to me in a laboratory. Yeah, this is uh, where the magic happens in terms of research. Now, what's the difference between what's going on around us here and what would be happening in a lab focused on GMOs, genetically modified organisms? What's the difference? I mean, that's taking genes from one organism and putting it into another organism. That's a kind of gene editing. Yeah, so with GMOs and even with human therapies that might be called gene therapies, typically what you're doing is you're taking some extra piece of DNA from somewhere else and you're, you're plopping it into some other cell or some other organism in sort of a non-specific way. So you take something from outside and slam it in. And what we're trying to do here is we're mostly trying to take existing sequences and edit them. 
Well, when you refer to the technique of GMOs as involving plopping in genes and slamming in genes, it sounds as though it's not all that precise. And it's my understanding that CRISPR technology actually is quite precise. What does it mean to be imprecise in this world of gene editing? I think that's a great point. The, the thing about GMOs and about gene therapy is typically you're using these things called transgenes. And these are bits of DNA that are coming from somewhere else. And then you're integrating them into the other genome in a relatively non-specific way. The only thing you really have control over is whether it goes in or not. You don't necessarily have control over where it goes in. And one of the big advances of CRISPR is now you get to choose exactly where things go in. Well, I wonder if you could give us just an overview of the therapeutic possibilities of CRISPR. I think of the therapeutic possibilities of CRISPR in sort of two ways. First off, there's what everybody thinks of when they think about editing genes, and that's curing genetic disease. Right now, when someone has a genetic disease, you treat the symptoms. But if you had a way to actually change the alphabet, change the genome of someone, you'd be able to actually cure the underlying cause of the genetic disease. So that's one way. On the other hand, CRISPR is a fantastic research tool for basic research, and so the, it really accelerates, just puts the pedal to the floor on our ability to ask questions. And so that means that it's not only going to help us cure genetic diseases, but will also help us do the kinds of experiments that we previously only dreamed of to figure out what underlies non-genetic diseases, cancers, neurological diseases, things that you might attack with so-called normal or traditional therapeutics. We can now possibly do so faster and easier through having better tools, thanks to CRISPR. Now, are genetic diseases, how, how straightforward is the genetic component? It's usually not one gene. It may be a variety of genes, a suite of genes. That sounds pretty complicated to go in and change all those genes and change them the right way so that you cure a disease. Yeah, most people that are thinking about genetic disease at this point are they're really aiming for the relatively low-hanging fruit. They're aiming for so-called monogenic diseases. Those are diseases that are caused by a single gene, maybe even a single base change. A great example of that would be sickle cell disease. So we're working on that in the lab. There's a single base that's mutated in sickle cell disease that leads to sickling, curvature of red blood cells, clogging of capillaries, and some really terrible effects downstream. We've known this single base change since 1949. We haven't been able to do anything about it. With the rise of gene editing, people have started to try to tackle this in a gene editing way to try to reverse that mutation. Well, are we talking about swapping out the gene that is causing the disease for a healthy one? Is it like swapping out one Lego block for another one? It's in fact even smaller than swapping out the gene. We really only need to swap out the single base, the single letter that's wrong in this case. So there's a, in this case, there's a single letter in the DNA alphabet that causes sickle cell disease, and we just need to change that letter back to what's found in healthy people. The CRISPR technology came about through a surprise revelation about how bacteria protect themselves from infection. They use this CRISPR system, and they do it by incorporating strands of viral DNA into their own DNA? That's right. So th there are a couple of big breakthroughs in CRISPR research, and it really all got started when people were sort of idly looking at bacterial sequences, and they suddenly realized that these weird structures called CRISPRs, which are repeats of sequences in bacterial genomes, almost exactly matched viral DNA. So to be clear, CRISPR, which we're talking, we refer to CRISPR technology, in this case, you're referring to the sequences themselves within the DNA of the bacteria. That's right. Yeah, so CRISPR stands for, I'm going to mangle this, I'm sure. That's uh, okay. I have it written down. See if you can remember. Perfect. Clusters of regularly interspaced palindromic repeats. Short, Short palind palindromic repeats. repeats. I knew I would miss something <laughs> in there, for sure. That's why we have acronyms. Yeah, precisely. So um, it, it is a little funny that this got named CRISPR. That's the name of what was originally seen in bacteria. What people almost always use to do the editing now are so-called Cas proteins, and those stand for CRISPR-associated sequences. Those are proteins that sit next to the CRISPR arrays. So what people noticed is there are these certain genes, and they happen to be next to these repeats, and those repeats almost exactly match viral sequences. So if a virus invades and the bacteria says, oh, I have a copy of this virus already in my genome, it can then recognize that virus that just invaded and cut it and try to get rid of it. So the bacteria are incorporating viral DNA into their DNA and then 
also using viral DNA to protect against further infection from viral DNA. That's exactly right. What part of the CRISPR technique are you programming? Is it the, the Cas9 protein or the RNA that is guiding it to the spot where you'll be doing the cutting? What part gets the programming? When we talk about programming for genome editing in the CRISPR sense, we're talking about changing the RNA. So these little CRISPR repeats that match the viral DNA, they make pieces of RNA. And it's those pieces of RNA that recognize the viral DNA. And the big realization was that, well, it doesn't have to be viral DNA that gets turned into RNA. You could make any sequence into RNA. And if you did that, then that RNA would get guided to wherever you need to cut. And so there's a certain protein called Cas9. It grabs onto a piece of RNA that has a certain structure. And then another part of that RNA, you can program to be whatever series of letters you want it to be. And then that piece of RNA that you've programmed will bind to a complementary region, someplace that it matches in another genome. And that other genome, in the case of bacteria, is a virus. But in our lab, we typically use it to target human sequences. The RNA guides the Cas9 protein to the spot in the DNA where you want to snip it or cut it, you know, as you you would maybe with the scissors, and then inserts another sequence, DNA sequence, the one that you want in that DNA, When these changes are made within a bacterium, does that bacterium pass it down? And then also conversely, what about with humans? Is that passed down to the children or does it need to be in the germline? So bacteria, they're single cell. And so every cell is of course a germline and bacterium. So when you edit a bacterium, it gets passed down. But humans, the only thing that we pass around to our children are the germ cells. And that's something that is currently not allowed in the United States for making edits that are going to pass down to the germline. And honestly, those are not the kinds of changes any researcher or clinician that I know of is really interested in. It turns out that most genetic diseases you could cure in a so-called somatic sense. That is, you could make an edit to an adult cell. Maybe you have a blood disease. You could make an edit by taking bone marrow out of an affected individual, make an edit at that bone marrow, and then put it back in to that individual. So it's sort of like a bone marrow transplant, but you're giving them a transplant with their own marrow. And then the cure stops with that individual. That's right. So at that point, the person who got the edit, their children would not carry that edit. Only they would carry that edit. Can we walk over here? Yeah, of course. I'm Caitlin Kazane. May I ask you what you're doing? Right now I have some bacteria and I'm removing a plasmid that we put in it. Can you just point out the bacteria to me? They were in these two right here, but right now we have, because they're in suspension, we have to spin them down so we can have just the cell pellets. I'm in a kind of suspension wondering what kind of bacteria they were. E. coli. E. coli grows really quickly, so if you put DNA into the bacteria as it grows, just helps the DNA expand more quickly and then we can process more of it at the same time. What is it about E. coli that makes it the go-to laboratory organism? It grows really well and it's really common and also we're using a non-pathogenic strain of it so there's no danger to us unless we decide decide to like drink it or something. If you decide it's just really late one night and you're thinking (laughs) I'm getting desperate so it's easier to work with than say redwood trees. Yeah. And how do you think Jacob's doing here explaining CRISPR to me? I think he's doing a good job. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So I understand that about 50% of bacteria use this CRISPR technique to protect themselves. What do the other 50% do? Oh, that's a great question. Rather than answering that exact question, I can maybe tell you about a paper that very recently came out. I think your question is really asking, how do other things protect themselves against viruses and infections, things like that? Well, it turns out that Even viruses have CRISPR systems. So it was just discovered that there's a giant virus that contains an antiviral system inside it. So viruses are fighting off viruses using these types of systems. It sounds like matter and antimatter duking it out. Yeah, it's very Inception-like. We're going all the way down this rabbit hole. Is there any limit to the number of changes you could make to an organism's genome? I think we're still figuring that out. It's definitely true that each tool you put in, each CRISPR tool you put in, 
there is some chance that it's going to have an off-target effect and you have to be very careful looking at those. So it's a little bit like if you were to take a pill with your doctor. You know, your, your doctor is not going to send you home with you know, a giant bucket full of pills because they might interact with each other in some way and it's a little hard to predict those sometimes. Likewise, we're probably not going to be doing anything where we totally try to rewrite genomes. We're instead, at the moment, going to be saying, oh, here's one mutation we need to change, and let's try to tackle that first. So I think it's important to remember we're still in very early days. I mean, the first papers on CRISPR came out a handful of years ago. So we're still understanding what tools we have, building new tools, and understanding how we might use them to combat diseases. Jacob Korn, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thanks very much for talking with me. Jacob Korn is the scientific director of the Innovative Genomics Initiative at the University of California, Berkeley. Well, as I leave campus now, I'm going to head south to the Silicon Valley, where CRISPR technology is being used not in a lab, but in one man's home. Safe travels, Molly, and good luck with the East Bay traffic. More on how the future of gene editing is quickly becoming present tense next. It's Genie in a Bottle on Big Picture Science. The technology for gene editing is not likely to remain confined to the laboratory. Jacob Korn wants CRISPR tools applied democratically, but some entrepreneurs want an even more populist approach. Never mind asking if you're ready for biotechnology, are you ready for DIY biotech? Well, we heard about the basics of CRISPR technology from Jacob Korn at the University of California in Berkeley, and now I'm many miles south in the Silicon Valley at the home of a man who is using CRISPR here. Josiah Zayner used to be a synthetic biologist with NASA, but he quit the agency to be a biohacker. He tinkers not with computer code, as the pioneering computer engineers did here in the Silicon Valley, but with genetic code and he's made basic molecular biology kits and CRISPR kits available to anyone through his online store. Hi, I'm Josiah. Welcome to my home slash lab. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Josiah, we just heard from Jacob Korn, uh, who is the scientific director at the Innovative Genomics Initiative at the University of California, Berkeley. Now, his team is working on ways of using CRISPR, and he does so with sophisticated laboratories and all these research scientists. Here we are in your home with your two cats, and you're doing CRISPR here? Yeah, I am. I mean, what people don't really understand is though there are these modern cutting edge synthetic biology techniques, they're actually not that difficult and don't require that many resources to pull off in a environment like your home. Now the cats are optional though, right? No, the cats are required. <laughs> okay. Well, is this your laboratory here? We're walking into your kitchen. Yeah, so this is part of my lab. It, it kind of grows and grows, so I kind of take over the kitchen when I can, unfortunately. So the idea is you do CRISPR on one side of the kitchen and the other side is where you cook your meals? <laughs> Sometimes they get a little mixed. <laughs> As you can see, like over here with the, the dishes and stuff, you know, cleaning glasses and also cleaning, you know, my labware at the same time. And so, yeah, in my lab, I have been doing experiments with yeast and bacteria in which using CRISPR to modify different parts of their genome. Can you do some of it here or just get started maybe with the first steps and how you might do that? Yeah, yeah, we could do set up some experiments. So what we're going to need to do, we're going to work with some bacteria. And the main goal when you're doing any genetic engineering is you're trying to get all your molecular biology tools inside the cells that you want to engineer. So for bacteria and yeast, it's really nice because you can use different chemical mixtures to get your tools inside the cells. Whereas, you know, mammalian cells and mice and things like that, it's a little more difficult. Generally, they use viruses or things. So first, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to pipette some of this chemical mixture into a tube. And the chemical mixture just contains a couple harmless molecules it contains some magnesium chloride um, which will help neutralize the charge of the dna we're trying to put inside the cells it contains some polyethylene glycol which just kind of helps open up the cell membrane to allow the dna to permeate the dna we're trying to put in the interesting thing about many organisms is when you put foreign dna in 
if it survives, if it makes it in the cell, and if the organism doesn't chop it up, the organism will integrate that kind of as part of their genetic material, and then they'll use that in their own cell. So what we can do is take like a CRISPR system that contains, you know, the Cas9 protein, a guide RNA, and some sort of donor or template DNA, and try to get that into the cell. A lot won't get into the cells, but because we're working, you know, with 10 to the 15, so like 10 with 15 zero different bacterial cells, eventually a few of them will work. All right, so I'm just gonna pipette a little bit of this liquid. You worked for NASA as a synthetic biologist for a long time. Are you still a synthetic biologist or are you a biohacker? That's a popular <laughs> term right now. Yeah, so uh, synthetic biology, I feel is kind of a term more associated with, uh, you know, academic or industrial institutions. And what I'm really trying to promote is this democratization of science. And I feel like even though I have a PhD, I am, and I want to be associated with the other people who are doing experiments in their homes, whether they have a PhD whether they don't have a PhD, whether they don't even have a bachelor's degree, right? And I think all those people and myself are biohackers. We're all doing experiments in our kitchen, regardless of our credentials, regardless of what people think of us or what people want to call us. Is, is that why you left NASA? Because in some ways it was limiting what you were able to experiment on? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't only limiting what I was able to experiment on. It was just... It was taking up so much of my time. And I mean, I guess somebody would probably say, well, that's life, right? Dealing with all the bureaucracy and trying to get around the bureaucracy. But I thought, you know what? If I could help other people work outside these institutional constraints, maybe a lot more can get done. All these problems that we face, like we face them together. I'm starting to think more broader and start to think about the other problems that can be solved by synthetic biology and genetic engineering and thinking about like medicine and you know food and energy and what happens if the amount of people researching them tripled or went up tenfold what happens if people in their homes started looking at how they could cure their own diseases for instance i've been working with counterculture labs which is a biohacker space in oakland and we've been working on creating insulin in bacteria and purifying it. So human insulin that diabetics need. So kind of circumventing the control of insulin from pharmaceutical companies and the government and kind of trying to reestablish it back into the hands of people who require it for life-saving care. Like we, we, we like to say, like, if there was a zombie apocalypse, you know, there'd be a lot of people who died. And then the people who die right after that would be People like diabetics because there's you know no manufacturing process to make it make the insulin so uh, help us help the diabetics survive the zombie apocalypse <laughs> <laughs> okay how is the solution doing right now we have solutions good so we're going to mix in some bacteria right now and what i'm going to do is i'm just going to gently scrape this white bacteria off this petri plate and mix it in this solution so now are the cell walls of those bacteria starting to open up? Yeah. So once they're mixed in the solution, it gets all cloudy. So you'd see there's actually a lot of bacteria on that. Could you do tests to find out what bacteria, other bacteria are in your kitchen? <laughs> yes, it, it, I actually can. So it's, it's actually fairly easy to do tests to uh, figure out what bacteria in your kitchen. Actually, on my website, we offer kits to identify bacteria. Well, that is part of your democratization of gene editing. You have an online store. It's the Open Discovery Institute or Odin.com, yeah. right? And you can go and buy E. coli kits and uh, basic molecular biology kits. Everything you need to become a amateur gene editor, molecular biologist. Sure. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't necessarily like to call it amateur. Let me, let me let, say that again. No, no, okay. no, it's fine. So, so everything... No, it's a good segue. I, I, I like that because okay. cause a lot of people think of it like that, like amateur. And I, I like to think of it like this. Like, so if you're at home and you do some programming, right? And you write a program 
people don't really call you an amateur programmer, right? You're a programmer. You did programming. I think when people do science, they are scientists. You know, we have cell phones and our cell phones are run on open source software based on the Linux operating system. And if you think about back in the 80s, 90s, when Linux was written, even now, if you'd say, who do you think or who would you have predicted wrote this operating system that's now, you know, comprises like 60% of all the computers and probably like 80% of all the computing devices in the world, including cell phones. Somebody probably would have said, oh, people at MIT or Stanford or NASA or someplace like that. But the, the fact is, it was written by some master student in Finland, Linus Torvalds, just in his free time, you know, hacking away by himself, programming on his computer, and he created this operating system that literally has changed our world. How are our bacteria doing? They're doing pretty good. So what we can do now is add a little bit of DNA, and then we just have to let them incubate for a while. And what is this DNA code for? What are we trying to turn this bacteria into? So we're going to try to turn them into a couple different things. We can add the CRISPR plasmid that will, it'll make a genetic edit in a gene that'll allow them to survive on some media that bacteria normally can't survive on. And another genetic engineering thing that we're going to do is we're going to add some DNA that will engineer the bacteria to make them actually give off light. So luminesce, they'll bioluminesce. Where they didn't before. Yeah, no, not at all, right? So it's pretty cool. They, they actually become like this little night light. <laughs> Could you use these kits uh, to edit and work on human DNA? So these kits you can't use directly on um, human cells. There would need to be modifications made and also delivery into human cells or mammalian cells is slightly more difficult that we at the Odin and also other people, we haven't really been able to overcome those issues in a home lab, both monetarily wise and more protocol wise. You have a little bit of a cold today. If you could edit and work on human cells, perhaps the human immune system, would you be able to cure yourself of that cold from within? <laughs> that would be pretty awesome. But honestly, if I could do anything, it would probably be, you know, to make myself have some wings or something, maybe a prehensile tail, like a third arm. <laughs> we won't be able to talk to you about all the stages in the experiment you're doing now, but what could we expect in the next few hours? So what we'll really see is glowing bacteria and uh, the genetically engineered CRISPR bacteria. We'll grow them up on Petri plates and we'll actually be able to see the results from the experiment, hopefully, if it works. Well, Josiah Zayner, thank you so much for opening up your house slash laboratory to us. Yeah, no problem. It was great to have you here. Josiah Zayner is a former synthetic biologist at NASA and now a biohacker, and a link to his store is on our website. And he leaves us a lot to think about on the drive back to the studio. If you had access to cutting edge biological tools or a CRISPR kit, what would you create? Hey, welcome back, Molly. So you've seen CRISPR in, in professional labs, you've seen CRISPR in the kitchen. Yes, and it is amazing how quickly this technology or these tools are evolving. Well, it's surprising to me that, in fact, that they found a technique that can so, if you will, simply make these changes in, in, in DNA. I mean, who would have predicted that five years ago and that it has such deeply consequential uh, implications? And as we've heard, the tools may be available to anyone. Well, that's right. I mean, it's, it's kind of a different kind of citizen science. It isn't, you know, big data citizen science or something like that. It's, it's real wetware in the kitchen. They can do things. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of ironic in a way because 300 years ago, all science was done that way, you know, by gentlemen, scholars at home, whatever. And then, you know, and Frankenstein, remember, he was doing sort of biology experiments in his stonewalled basement. 
And that looks a little ludicrous to us now, 100 years later, but we're sort of going back that way. I, I find that very interesting. Well, it's interesting that you bring up the figure of Frankenstein because certainly there are ethical questions that arise with this technology. And while there are a number of genes that we might like to get rid of that are no longer advantageous for us, uh, the question is whether we should. And then there are a number of other questions that arise, one of them being whether or not we should be doing editing on germ cells. Now, Dr. Korn said that there's a moratorium on that now, but will there always be? Yes. The big question is, obviously, you want to fix individuals. If you have some illness, I love this idea from uh, Jacob Korn. You don't treat the symptoms, you treat the disease. That's extraordinarily attractive. But uh, changing the species, well, that's something else. That's different than fixing an individual. It sounds like there are a number of ethical questions with this technology. For all its promise, there is some peril, and I'm sure that is a discussion that we will continue to have as this technology develops. Thanks to those genies without whose editing we couldn't produce this show, Gary Niederhoff, Barbara Vance, and our intern, Aaron Ross. Also, thanks to financial support from Rena Shulsky david and Sammy David. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to Genie in a Bottle. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science episodes, well, you'll find them in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. If you're a podcast listener, but you prefer listening to over-the-air radio because your ancient genes never knew about the internet well check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program and if your local station is not on that list consider letting them know that you like the show oh and if you listen by using itunes well we invite you to leave a review about big picture science on our itunes page and to reach us directly with your comments well just tell us what's on your mind and email it to bigpicturescience at seti.org I'd be friends with the sparrows and the boy who shoots the arrows if I only had a heart.